the World Economic Forum. I'm joined today by my colleague and friend, Eno de Boer from McKinsey, who is right now with us in our TV studio in New York. Eno, a very warm welcome. Thank you, Francisco. It's a pleasure to be hosting this event with you today. In the current geopolitical context, local manufacturing and supply chain resilience are becoming increasingly important. At the same time, organizations face new obstacles as they strive to engage their workforce and sustain operations amidst international unrest. Furthermore, there are new pressures related to the need to maintain sustainability commitments and accelerate the transition towards renewable energy while addressing more immediate energy market disruptions. These concurrent challenges call for innovation and leadership and inspiration. What we actually need is a guide, a guide to help organizations find a path forward and be able to navigate today's uncharted waters by leveraging technology-enabled operations. The members of our Global Lighthouse Network have inspired the development of such a playbook, and we will share our main learnings with all of you today. We will also welcome the newest members of the network, which has grown to over 100 sites. A hundred lighthouses? That's an impressive number, you know? There are many among our audience who are joining us for the very first time on our Lighthouse Live event. Francisco, could you give us a quick introduction to the Global Lighthouse Network? Absolutely. The Global Lighthouse Network is a community of production sites and value chains that are world leaders in successfully adopting the cutting edge technologies of the fourth industrial revolutions. Lighthouses are using these technologies to maximize efficiency and competitiveness at scale. They are transforming business models and driving economic growth. And they are improving workforce engagement while delivering environmental results and boosting productivity. That's right, Francisco. The old belief that companies couldn't achieve environmental impact and productivity at the same time is just wrong. The Lighthouse has proved that it's possible to do both at the very same time. Actually, the COVID-19 pandemic has sped up digitization efforts in so many areas and ways. To achieve impact and results, companies need to adopt technologies at scale and avoid pilot purgatory. Eno, 
Why don't you tell us a bit more about this? Well, you're right, Francisco. It's important to move quickly and at scale to escape the pilot trap. Many of our lighthouses are tackling several business problems with digital at the same time. So I'm super delighted to welcome today our first two procurement lighthouses. What really sets our lighthouses apart from others is that they are not pursuing growth at any cost. Instead, they have a responsible approach. They engage their workforce and drive environmental sustainability at the same time. We will be announcing three new sustainability lighthouses today. These companies show us how to reduce environmental impact. Why are these lighthouses so successful? Because they have, from the very, very start, put the people at the center of the digital transformation. It's all about how you engage the workforce. Our second panel discussion today will focus on exactly this topic. Our new report, the Playbook for Responsible Industry Transformation, highlights all of this. It gives insights on how companies can scale 4IR technologies to not only achieve greater operational performance, but really to do this in a responsible way. Well, thank you, Eno. The companies we're about to meet have demonstrated that this playbook actually works. And I'm delighted to start welcoming the new members that are joining our Global Lighthouse Network today. We added 30 new sites to the network, which brings the total number of lighthouses to 103. Lighthouses come from all around the world and represent different industry sectors. These are companies of different sizes and they are all lighting the way for our global manufacturing community. Let's discover who these lighthouses are. Sanofi is one of our first procurement lighthouses. Welcome into the network. It's using 4IR solutions such as smart tender analytics, supplier performance analytics, and should cost modeling with impact far beyond procurement. Likewise, Teva is also one of our first procurement lighthouses. Teva's global procurement function is leading the way for the company with analytics-driven 4IR solutions, such as implementing a machine learning-based spend queue. BOE Technology Group, one of the largest LCD manufacturing companies in the world, is widely using artificial intelligence to transform production. You have more, most likely seen their products in action. Bosch Automotive in Shangsha is overcoming supply chain challenges by using automation and AI solutions. By deploying 45 technology use cases, the site is maintaining its market position and achieving carbon neutrality. With increased demand for high quality products and services, Hire's Zhengzhou water heater factory is using big data and 5G edge computing to build close connections with suppliers, customers and other plants. We have again two sites from Johnson & Johnson. The consumer health site in Bangkok uses a range of 4IR technologies such as collaborative supply chain control towers to address agility, profitability, and cost to serve challenges. The Pharma Latina site created a digital connected end-to-end -end supply chain. An industry-first real-time release technology reduces production lead time. LG Electronics redesigned an old factory in Changwon to create a digital lighthouse plant. It's using digital solutions to manage its growing product portfolio complexity and meet rising quality expectations. Two media sites are welcomed to the network today. The Tsingzhou site, a 30-year-old factory, adopted advanced technologies at scale to transform the manufacturing system. Examples include a lights out injection molding, automation enabled by artificial intelligence. Also at Media, the HEFI site um, is the company's biggest manufacturing center of washing machines. 
They have deployed intelligent logistics by using IoT and blockchain technology. PMG in Wanzhou is successfully leveraging artificial intelligence, flexible automation and digital twins. They created a highly responsive supply chain which is serving consumers across multiple channels. Facing changing customer demands, Schneider Electric invested into force industrial revolution solutions such an end-to-end -end agile supply chain control tower. This has drastically reduced lead times. Unilever deployed predictive analytics to speed up product formulation. This is driven by the need to accelerate the pace of innovation and speed of response to consumer demand. We have 13 new lighthouses. What an amazing cohort. Congratulations to all of them. It's now time to hear from our global lighthouse CEOs. Francisco will lead a discussion focused on accelerating and scaling force industrial revolution transformation. I'm delighted to introduce our first panel discussions of the day with leaders of our lighthouses. They will share real life examples from their own lighthouses. The members of the Global Lighthouse Network are using the technology trends of today to set the standards of tomorrow. To learn more about these trends, I'm delighted to be joined by Mr. Cho, CEO of LG Electronics, Mr. Schultz, CEO of Teva Pharmaceuticals, and Mr. Chen, Chairman of BOE. They will talk about the solutions and results that led their facilities to be recognized at lighthouses in 2022. Thank you all for joining us today. It's a real pleasure to have you here with us. Mr. Cho, let me start with you. And first of all, many congratulations for the Lighthouse recognition. Your Chan Won site has joined our network as part of, the, of this year's cohort. And we have seen the site improve labor availability and increase its product portfolio complexity by 70%, which is impressive and all through the adoption of 4 ir driven technologies and applications. Why is Chan Wont leading the way across your production network that counts today on a total of 26 production facilities? Okay, to start, on behalf of entire LG Electronics, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to the World Economic Forum. It is my honor to be designated uh, as a lighthouse factory. Before going into why we started with Changwon Factory, uh, let me talk about uh, our customers and recent trends. The customers' usage pattern are getting more personalized uh, to the extent that home appliances are now even regarded as individual appliances. Together with the advancement of digital technologies, this personalization trend is providing significant challenges to the entire value chain of the company, especially the manufacturing system. To properly respond to these challenges, we decided to come up with a more advanced and sophisticated system by applying fourth industrial revolution technologies with massive investment in Changwon plant. The Changwon plant, uh, the place where LG Electronics home appliance history started, is the base camp for production of some of the most complex and premium products that require innovative ways of manufacturing. So with uh, its proximity to LG's core technologies and assets, we could concentrate all our integrated competencies along with internal as well as external solution partners and finally accomplish disruptive yet quite successful changes going through trial and error and quick adjustment. We also believe uh, Changwon Factory has advantages to easily replicate and spread its practices to the rest of our global production facilities. Excellent. Well, many thanks. And Mr. Chen, congratulations to you as well. Your site in Fuju is receiving the Lighthouse recognition just two years after the start of its digital transformation journey to enable product diversification and to address a fast racing product demand, BOE leveraged 4 IR technology to significantly increase its competitiveness. 
Can you tell us more about what were the main reasons that led your team to successfully accelerate digital transformation at such a pace? First of all, uh, would like I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, my digital transformation team. We wouldn't be here today without uh, uh, their years of excellent efforts. It is a great honor for us to be named a lighthouse factory. Uh, there are reasons why BOE attaches great importance to and accelerates the capability building of smart manufacturing and digital transformation. First, it is a future-oriented strategy based on profound uh, insights into the trend of the global economy, uh, the 4IR, and the development uh, patterns of the semiconductor display industry. The BOE has long realized uh, the importance of increasing uh, productivity through smart manufacturing. Uh, therefore, as early as 2015, when in initially setting up the Fuzhou plant, we positioned it as the world's most competitive smart uh, semiconductor display plant and empower it uh, with substantial 4IR technologies to boost its efficiency. Uh, second, we aim to share and replicate our digital operation experience and smart uh, manufacturing practices accumulated uh, for nearly 20 years and to build a standardized uh, smart manufacturing system with dynamic upgrading that operates across the company. Now, BOE has 17 uh, panel plants uh, in mainland China, and we have accumulated uh, profound intellectual capital and industry leading smart uh, manufacturing capabilities, which have integrated into a unified industrial internet platform. We are also uh, striving to share and replicate the smart manufacturing technologies and advanced manufacturing experience across all our 17 plants to improve BOE's overall smart manufacturing level, among which the Fuzhou plant uh, is an extraordinary uh, example. Third, smart manufacturing and digital operation brings in huge profits. BOE uh, Fujo plan to the lighthouse on the basis uh, of a fully automatic production system has widely adopted AI and advanced analytical technologies. For example, the uh, AOI uh, based automatic repair machines uh, through data interaction and check uh, repair synergy uh, can reduce manpower by approximately 20 percent. And besides that, uh, through big data analysis and machine learning, uh, the quality uh, improvement of new products accelerates uh, by approximately 43 percent. And this will bring tangible profits to our company. Uh, thank you very much. Congratulations to you and your team once again. Mr. Schultz, let me, let me turn to you now, and a very warm welcome to the, to the Global Lighthouse Network. Teva is one of the first lighthouses recognized for the digitization of its procurement function, and your digital transformation journey actually started from procurement, from this function, which is something new to the network. What led your teams to accelerate digital transformation with a particular focus on procurement? Procurement focus was really based on the history of the company. Teva has a mission to be a leader in generics and biopharmaceuticals, helping patients live better lives worldwide. And we serve around 200 million patients every day. And we have been created through a lot of mergers, more than 20 mergers over 20 years. And that resulted in us having a IT backbone with more than 25 ERP systems, around 80 factories worldwide, but everything had been brought together through mergers, not through organic growth. And when we were then faced with some economic challenges uh, some four years ago and had to restructure, we realized that in order to improve our gross margin, then we simply had to get a better grip of procurement, simply due to the fact that we were buying for nearly $8 billion a year and that was a major part of our cost structure. And unless we could improve that part of the cost structure, we would not really be able to improve our overall profitability. Given the fact that we do more than 30,000 different products in these many plants worldwide, it's of course very difficult unless you digitalize and you get all the data in-house and you get the assessment of all your suppliers in-house in some smart databases with smart analytics. So without the help of artificial intelligence, 
we would not have been able to get the overview and reach the benefits we've seen by much more consolidated procurement for the whole group. And the reason for that is, of course, that we came out of much more fragmented procurement historically, and that the data was still sitting in fragmented IT systems. In parallel with the digitalization of procurement, we've also been consolidating our ERP backbone. So we are soon in a situation where we only have one ERP backbone, one set of systems, and that will, of course, further enhance the analytical capabilities we have so that we will be able to even more improve our worldwide sourcing and also our worldwide logistics. So it's been a long journey. It's been with the purpose of improving gross margins, but it's really been fed by using modern technology and uh, artificial intelligence and digitalizing all the data needed to keep an overview of this enormous network serving hundreds of millions of patients and delivering billions and billions of tablets and other products every year. Impressive. Thank you so much, Mr. Schultz. And, and let me maybe change a bit the focus of the discussion now. We know that key enablers such as training programs, agile ways of working or new technology ecosystems are critical for companies to successfully drive digital transformation. And maybe a question to you, Mr. Chen. Empowering your employees with advanced analytics supported by a dedicated transformation office has been a major driver, a major enabler of success for your companies. Can you tell us more about some of those key enablers that power your digital transformation journey? Uh, uh, the successful transformation of BOE can be uh, attributed uh, to four enablers. Uh, first, uh, optimizing management uh, organization, especially the digital management system. We have uh, established a three-tier digital uh, management system covering the group as a whole, uh, the manufacturing plants and the cross-functional teams. Uh, we have established a professional office of digital transformation uh, responsible for the unified uh, uh, planning and management of transformation projects in regards to organizations, processes, and IT, and that in an effort uh, to build a one digital and visual BOE. For example, in BOE Fuzhou plant, we also set up a special team of digital transformation led uh, by the plant uh, general manager and equipped with agile groups in charge and responsible for implementing our digital transformation strategy uh, so as to further ensure the successful digital transformation of the whole uh, company. Second, uh, emphasizing uh, the actual effectiveness of digitization, we believe that the core of digital transformation is data-driven management transformation. And the goal is to improve management quality and operational efficiency. Uh, in BOE Fuzhou plant, we have widely adopted industrial internet technologies. For instance, we collect the process data of over 1,700 main process machines and over 40, uh, uh, 4,000 auxiliary process machines and using FMC uh, system um, and to uh, dynamically uh, monitor the operation of uh, machines and finally uh, integrate them into a data lake, uh, including the data of delivery, costs, and manufacturing, and planning, et cetera. And by further data analysis, we have developed uh, diverse uh, smart uh, applications which serve to improve operational efficiency and profits. Third, uh, accumulating uh, intellectual uh, capital, we established BOE Smart Manufacturing School uh, in one aspect uh, uh, to summarize the practical experience of benchmark uh, uh, plants and elevate it uh, to intellectual capital at the company level and in other aspect to train all the employees and use the experience gained uh, to the fullest extent uh, so as to uh, improve the company's smart manufacturing level as a whole. Uh, in BOE Fuzhou plant, we further divide the digital talent into six categories and set up uh, uh, corresponding positions uh, related uh, uh, to digital uh, transformation. For example, uh, the plant general manager is responsible for setting the digitalization vision and goals and transformation leaders are in charge of uh, piloting and replicating experience. Uh, transformation engineers are uh, responsible for implementing the application uh, of digitalization on site. Fourth, uh, fourth, sorry, fourth, building on an ecosystem, uh, BOE Fuzhou plant has been actively absorbing advanced uh, practices and building and improving its ecosystem. 
uh, to promote ecological integration for win-win co-innovation with its partners. Meanwhile, uh, it expands uh, its cooperation with universities and research institutions, especially in forward-looking technologies and foster uh, greater uh, synergy for key breakthroughs. We have also uh, established BOE Innovation Partner Conference and other uh, platforms uh, so as to uh, uh, promote exchanges and, um, and uh, cooperations uh, of um, industry uh, partners. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Impressing, impressing investments and developments that are powering innovation at BOE. Let me come back to you, Mr. Chen, on this topic of, of ecosystems. Your Chan Bon site developed an advanced technology ecosystem through strong collaborations with robots manufacturers, IT companies, and collaborations with universities as well. How critical was this network to enable the transformation of your site? Yes, uh, as you said, our technology ecosystem was very critical to the successful transformation of Changwon factory. Uh, it really played a key role in facilitating uh, integration of partners' uh, tech solutions, orchestrating resources and composing services, and encouraging co-creation of best use cases among ecosystem partners. We plan to leverage the full strength of our partners to maximize speed, efficiency, and productivity, and achieve synergetic mutual growth, and eventually create a diverse technological enablers. For example, we were able to establish a three-dimensional logistics systems to reduce factory space by 30%. The digital twin technology uh, helped us shorten development and setup time by 30%. And predictive maintenance system was created based on cloud and edge computing technology to boost productivity by 20%. All of these achievements were only possible by the collaboration and contribution among ecosystem partners. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chu. And 20% productivity increase is definitely an impressive number and, and results. Congratulations on, on that. Mr. Schultz, let me, let me come back to you. I mean, it has taken only or just two years for your procurement function to dis digitize and smartly process, and you made this data available across the entire company, which is impressive. What ecosystem did Teba build to help achieve such an impact? And what were the challenges that you face? throughout the journey? So the challenges from the beginning was, like I said before, the diverse structure of the company having been amalgamated to all these mergers and having uh, manufacturing sites all over the world and of course having procurement flows all over the world. So the aim was really the same aim as for the whole company, which was to integrate the company working as one server, ensuring that we could serve the patients we serve every day in the best possible way. And in order to do that, we have done sort of a two-pronged approach. One approach was let's consolidate and optimize our IT platform as fast as possible. So in parallel with working with them, we have been able to take out, you would say, all the procurement data from the different subsystems that had not yet been consolidated, pull them in together to get a worldwide consolidated view on all the different things that we procure. And of course, that's the only way to really optimize your integration with your suppliers, get the best possible overview of logistics and flows throughout the year by doing this. It's not ideal yet, I would say, because what we really want to have is this backbone system that's fully integrated worldwide. We will have that completed in about two years. Then we'll have all the basic data in one system, pulling it out, analyzing it, using artificial intelligence to do the right decisions. And in doing so, you could say we've had to work very much together with our IT function, because that's, of course, a key part of the, the, the basic, the foundational data structures and data transfers and data accumulations, but also working very, very close with all the manufacturing sites. Because without the engagement of the manufacturing sites, who are depending on the flows of products every day for their manu actual manufacturing, you don't get to optimize this. And in the future, we are looking to a, you would say, 
completely optimized system that also include all the logistical pieces and the total optimization worldwide. So it's, it's a journey we are on. I would say that we have come quite a good way and you're absolutely right about the number. The number is close to $8 billion a year. And of course, we want to optimize both the quality of procurement, the price uh, of the p things we procure, but also, of course, the availability. And in today's environment, with all the discussions about supply chains, it's, of course, extremely important that you have an optimized supply chain and optimized procurement, not just on price, but also on quality and security of supplies. And we think uh, so far it's been very successful. Many thanks, Mr. Schulz, and it's impressive to see how, how data is powering the collaboration in between the, the different functions across the, the organization. Maybe one more question. I mean, when you, when you look at the years ahead, what's your vision and plan to further scale digital transformation beyond procurement and to start transforming multiple functions? Yeah, so I'm hoping that we can take this use of artificial intelligence and broaden it out significantly. We're already doing it actually a lot in our R&D functions. So when we do clinical trials, there's a lot of data being generated. And combining all this data, you can make better decisions about your development programs for new pharmaceuticals to help people in the, in the future. So that's just one example. But we're using it everywhere. We're also trying to get better at estimating demand. We are supplying, as I said, we're the biggest supplier of generic pharmaceuticals worldwide. So we have very, very big volumes. And it's sometimes a challenge to predict, of course, correctly these many, many SKUs. What will the actual demand be? How do we optimize our manufacturing planning? And there we are trying to use artificial intelligence as well. And I think in the future, we will have sort of 24 seven updated data on all movements and all demand signals. And that will make the whole manufacturing even more effective. And it's really also good for the environment because the more effective we get, the less waste there will be the less scrap there will be, the more precise we can supply the markets with what they actually need, what the patients actually need. So we're also having a big drive to improve our environmental performance, which is linked to basically optimizing the resource usage all over the value chain. So, so there are many exciting things in the coming years. Impressive and definitely very exciting, especially what you just mentioned about seeing the results and the impact going beyond productivity and, and, and impacting areas such as sustainability that are so critical nowadays. So thank you, Mr. Schultz. Mr. Chu and, and Mr. Chen, let me get back to you. Uh, your lighthouses have shown the, the potential of applying digital solutions and advanced analytics as well within your manufacturing facilities. Uh, and maybe Mr. Chu, what is your plan to further scale the deployment of these advanced technologies and solutions to improve operations across your entire production network, I mean, in the, in the next year or the, the couple of years ahead? LG Electronics Global Manufacturing Network is made up of uh, 26 sites in 13 different countries. Uh, so our goal is to apply the digital technologies pioneered at Changwon plant uh, to the other LG production sites around the world. Uh, based on similarities in our production systems, we adopted modularized solutions, which are easy to fit for different sites, accelerating the speed of global expansion. So I would like to call this innovation as a service for internal customers. And also during the pandemic, we expanded the use of teleoperation technology to provide effective virtual support to overseas subsidiaries minimizing the need for travel. As our next step, we seek to establish a seamless data flow across the entire value chain to optimize our total supply chain management from AI-based demand forecasting to manufacturing and from procurement to customer services. With this, uh, we will make a full operation structure that is more agile uh, in responding to customer needs. That's my answer. Excellent. And I, I really like the concept of innovation as a service. I will definitely follow one offline on that one to, to learn more. Thank you. And Mr. Chen, maybe same question to you. What is your plan to scale technologies for AR across your, your entire production network? Thank you. Looking ahead, the digitalization and intellectualization of all the elements in industrial production will be normal. 
and smart manufacturing will always stay at the forefront and become essential to keeping the manufacturer competitive in the industry. BOE will integrate its replicable capabilities accumulated over the years into platforms and systems of smart manufacturing, empower the upstream and downstream of the value chain through BOE's industrial internet platform, build a smart manufacturing network linking the whole industrial chain, set up an integrated supply manufacturing platform with the fastest speed, the highest efficiency, the lowest cost, and the best quality, so as to integrate four IR technologies into our development strategy and the intellectual cap capital of the industry, elevating the smart manufacturing of the global semiconductor display industry to a new level. In an era of IoT with everything interconnected, screens are the displaying windows of the IoT world. BOE launched in the strategy of screen-connected IoT in 2021, integrating more functions into the screens, developing the screens into more forms, and creating more application scenarios with a view to empowering the whole industrial chain to create greater value. We'll stick to your customer-oriented strategies as always, continue to increase investment and innovation, so as to provide optimized products and services. Together with global partners and lighthouses, we aim to jointly build cooperative platforms for win-win development opportunities and a brighter future. Thank you. We are delighted to welcome the three of you into the Global Lighthouse Network. And thank you especially for taking the time to share your vision and, and valuable insights with our global manufacturing community today. Thank you, and with that, Eno, let me go back to you. That was a fascinating discussion. I really enjoyed hearing Mr. Chen talking about how a well-designed digital transformation pays off rapidly and is key for sustainable growth. It highlights how lighthouses act as scale-up vehicles for the entire organization. It's the scale that boosts the returns. So often we talk about increasing impact, but as mentioned earlier, our latest report talks about the need for responsible operations, including the need to improve environmental footprint to do more with less. I'm now excited to announce three new sustainability lighthouse designations. These are sites or value chains using digital and analytic solutions to make an outside positive environmental impact in addition to significant financial and operational results. Let's meet our new sustainability lighthouses. Through adaptive process control, Johnson Cork has optimized its processes and reduced carbon emissions. This is contributing to its corporate pledge of reaching carbon neutrality in 2030. Schneider's site in Le Vol de Rue unlocked data through IoT sensors connected to their digital platform. This is improving energy management and reducing CO2 emissions at the site, contributing to Schneider's corporate pledge to be net zero carbon by 2030. Western Digital Smart Factory in Penang is driving energy reduction through machine learning powered lighthouse automation and smart energy usage optimization. Thank you, Eno. We have one more panel discussion today, featuring three leaders from our Global Lighthouse Network who will share their insights on responsible transformation. They will talk about how environmental sustainability and workforce engagement are critical to the success of any transformation. I'm delighted to introduce Katie George, senior partner and chief people officer at McKinsey and a close friend of our Global Lighthouse Network who will be leading today's final discussion. Katie, over to you. Thank you very much, Francisco. Um, today, I'm very excited to be joined by three leaders of companies that have been recognized not only as digital lighthouses, but as sustainability lighthouses. Companies that have demonstrated fantastic results on improving the environmental sustainability of their operations, even while also 
achieving fantastic breakthrough performance on other dimensions. They're showing us what is possible in terms of delivering not only great economic results, but also great environmental results. They also have really been innovating the way that they work with their workforces and through their workforces to deliver these breakthrough results. Um, these are companies that have invested in upskilling and engaging their front lines in ways that have unleashed fantastic uh, innovation and creativity and really empowered their front line to do things uh, at, that they've never done before. Uh, they've also done things at scale. So each of these companies has been able to demonstrate not only that they can uh, pilot uh, uh, new technologies, but have truly transformed their way of working in order to create sustained outcomes. So with that, I am delighted to be joined by three leaders. Christine, Christine Bastian, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief People Officer of Western Digital. Kathy Wengel, the Executive Vice President and Chief Global Supply Chain Officer of Johnson & Johnson. And Osa Thompsons, Senior Vice President and Head of Business Area Technologies and New Businesses of Ericsson. Thank you all very much for joining me. Um, Christine, let me start with you. Congratulations on your recent recognition as a lighthouse. Um, I know that your Penang site has experienced very significant volume growth four times in the last five years. Um, but you've done that while maintaining and achieving your sustainability pledge. So can you tell us a little bit about how your fourth industrial revolution uh, technology applications have allowed you to do that? AB, thank you. So we at Western Digital recognize the importance of doing our part to contain global temperature rise. And so it was important to pledge and set our ambitious goal to limit the increase to less than 1.5 Celsius by 2030. While we've made significant improvements the past few years, we have a lot of work to achieve our goal. It is particularly challenging to achieve the goal while the factory is going through expansion. And so that's why we rely on 4IR technologies to drive eco-efficiency. 4IR technologies have helped boost our operations productivity and efficiency. This increased our operational performance to support the growth without the need to add more resources or machines that consume more energy. 90% of the greenhouse gas emissions we create come from electricity. So we deployed more than 1,000 industrial IoT sensors to more than 500 pieces of equipment and 15 utility systems to gather data and generate analytics insights. This allows us to optimize energy consumption across the entire factory. This is how 4IR technology accelerates sustainability for Western Digital. Christine, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, Kathy, I know that you and Johnson & Johnson are also working towards a sustainability pledge um, and that your uh, site in Cork, in Janssen's Cork site, has implemented adaptive process controls and reduced carbon emissions uh, per kilogram of product by 56%, which is just fantastic. Um, I know that uh, meeting your growing business demands at the same time as working towards your sustainability goals are very challenging. How have you done that? What is your strategy? Well, thank you, Katie. It's great to be here with everyone. And I'd say our strategy hinges really on three approaches, accountability, digital, and partnerships. So first, it's about setting bold climate commitments that demonstrate our accountability as Johnson & Johnson to making science-based progress. Uh, for more than three decades, we've been setting publicly facing environmental goals, and we continue to commit to bold goals, uh, including the intention to source 100% of our global electricity needs from renewable sources by 2025, and to be carbon neutral in our global operations by 2030. So along with that, then, we're harnessing digital and Industry 4.0 advanced manufacturing technologies to reduce our carbon footprint and, to your earlier point, drive greater resilience. So it's just so proud of our team to receive our first WEF sustainability designation for our lighthouse, as you mentioned, in, in Cork, Ireland. Uh, our Cork site's really been a model in our global supply chain of how to reduce that environmental footprint using 4IR technologies, uh, whether it's the physical wind turbine that was installed there, but 
also having power purchase agreements with local wind farms in Ireland. We then use that adaptive advanced process control and digital twin technologies to optimize the performance, not only in manufacturing, but of our chillers, our pumps, our cooling towers. Uh, those are some of the biggest energy users uh, on the site and also have a really important impact in plant reliability and cost. So now that we scaled those, uh, we, we've rolled that out to 16 of our sites, and we really look at our, our Cork site as one of our leaders uh, in the sustainable, uh, sustainability journey and that intersection of better performance and a better outcome for the planet. That's great, Kathy, thank you very much. Really impressive. Uh, and Osa, your Louisville site uh, has actually built sustainability into the very design of the building and the site itself right through heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems uh, that are controlled smartly and you've reduced energy consumption by 24%. So if you can talk about what is Ericsson's approach and how does this help you towards your sustainability goals? Thank you, Katie. And first of all, great to be here. Uh, I think, first of all, uh, just as Christine and Kate mentioned, and I don't think it's a coincidence, we all care about how can we contribute to meet uh, and do our share of meeting the sustainability goals, right? And that means that we need to think differently, we need to consume differently, and we actually need the latest technologies to realize that. Um, so that's kind of one piece of it. The other part is we are a technology company, so we also feel um, because then obligation to be an example for other companies on what you can do if implemented right. So, so there are two parts for us. So. I, it really comes back to our mission, you know, creating connection that makes the imaginable possible. Uh, and we really want to do that by using limitless connectivity to improving people's life, redefine business, and create a, a more sustainable future. And this may sound like marketing, uh, but I think when it comes to, you know, creating that sustainable future, I think that's become a guiding star for us. And I think the Lewisville factory is a great example of that. Because it's not only about energy efficiency. It's not only about bringing the latest technologies. It is actually showing what you can do if you use the design thinking, the best operational domain competence, bring the best people together, and apply the best technologies. And, and it, it, we talk about a lot of the smart ways we optimize the latest um, or optimize the energy efficiency and usage. But it's also back to using 100% renewable sources reducing uh, rainwater to reduce you know, uh, the water usage, uh, but also building the site with reusable recyclable materials. So as you hear, a lot of the technology leadership, it's not only about 5G, which we love to talk about, or all the smart AI applications, it's actually also about uh, all the development happening on the material side uh, and on the design side. And I think that's what's really, really exciting. And then you can say, why is this important for example? Well, we need to change our supply chain, the way we produce. So this way we can reduce our energy efficiency, our water usage, but also we manage to actually get closer to the customer who we serve. So we're actually able to deliver better products faster to the customer while actually reducing the airborne part of our supply chain by, uh, from 30% to 10%, right? And that becomes, you know, this is how you make this possible, like a blueprint within Ericsson. So how can we now replicate a lot of this across our production system, as well as a great example to all our technology partners, all our customers, and all enterprises who want to do a similar journey on how can you make this happen? So that's why I would say Lewis Will is super important for us in many ways, both for our customers, our US business, for us showing that this is possible internally at Ericsson and inspire others to go on the journey. That's great, Oza. I think you just captured the essence of, of what the Lighthouse Network is trying to do in terms of inspiring both within your own companies and outside. So thank you for that. Um, and you mentioned something else that I wanted to shift to, which is this notion that it's not just about technology, it's also about people. And um, you know, one of the things that I think we found uh, is that all of your companies have really put workforce and people in the center of your deployment and your approaches. And that's a bit counter to some of the popular press about how automation and digital technologies are going to uh, somehow disempower the workforce or even put them out of work. 
Um, what we've seen from your companies and the others is really innovative um, upskilling programs, um, whole academies, new types of apprenticeship. Um, we've also seen this notion of ideation hubs to promote innovation in different ways. Um, and then we've also seen wholesale organizational restructuring to unleash new workforce capabilities and kind of realign uh, workforce um, to the agile approach um, and the end-to-end -end value chain approach that you're all using uh, in the 4IR applications. So maybe I could talk to each of you and just ask each of you to comment a bit on what you're doing from a workforce perspective. And maybe Kathy, I'll start with you and Johnson & Johnson. Um, I know when your site was designated a lighthouse back in 2018, which feels like quite a long time ago, um, one of the things that was highlighted was the in-house technical capabilities and the knowledge development that you were pursuing. We'd love to know um, how has that worked for you and what, how have you evolved and what have you learned over the last several years uh, and what is your workforce strategy going forward? Well, thank you, Katie. And you know, to your point about about why we came together as as lighthouses and why certainly J and J uh, wanted to be a pioneer there was we disagreed with that premise that that the fourth industrial revolution was going to move around our 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 employees versus having them be at the heart of everything we do. And, and being a company that's been here for more than 135 years, our amazing talent in our plants and around the company have had to go through multiple industrial revolutions. So, so we knew and we know how important it is to keep our employees at the center of this. And to your question about, you know, the last three years, you know, if anything, it's put an even greater emphasis on upskilling uh, our employees in areas like digital, but in areas about how that intersects with risk management and resilience and supporting the mental and the physical well-being of our on-site superheroes, advancing diversity and inclusion, because all of these things really come together. Osa mentioned design thinking. It's really about, you know, how do you design your workforce for the capabilities you need for the future? And so when we look at those opportunities, I think one, again, it's, it's diverse and inclusive workforce drives innovation. It drives innovation that's reflective of the stakeholders and the communities we serve and a digitally first workforce at all levels acts with much more agility uh, and it enables us to build partnerships and capabilities that drive scale across the global network not only inside our company but with many many more partners uh, then i'd say we're you know we're really amplifying efforts to attract and retain a more diverse uh, and inclusive workforce uh, development programs we've we've put in place across our corporation uh, on resilience and digitally adept talent uh, we have specific focus areas uh, including our women in STEM 2D program. And that D, by the way, is about design thinking that goes into everything we do in science and technology, uh, engineering, math, manufacturing. Uh, and it's about upskilling using uh, industry 4.0 tools uh, all the way out to, to uh, mental health resilience. So we really see that it, it comes together uh, in our commitment to our team members uh, to upskill them. And that sparks their innovation innovation uh, in how we keep our company at the forefront of everything we do. That's great. And, um, you know, you talk about the connection between workforce investment and innovation and agility. And I know, Christine, that that's been really central to your work at Western Digital as well. Um, the Penang site joined the Global Lighthouse Network only in 2021, so a bit more recently. But I know that one of the things that you have done there is to create an agile digital studio, which really drives ideation and innovation in a very participative way. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and particularly what you've learned during the pandemic? Because as Kathy mentioned, that's uh, added a new layer of complexity, but potentially also acceleration to our efforts. That's right, Katie. Uh, and thank you um, for, for the question, because it's really important. And I think similar to Kathy's point, 
people are at the forefront um, when we think about innovation. And so at Western Digital, we pride ourselves on being at the forefront of game-changing innovations, from the invention of the first hard disk drive to the recent advancements in 3D NAN. We're constantly pushing the technology and the innovation boundaries to turn the impossible to possible. And it's 4IR um, that is about connectedness. When we think about connecting our people with this purpose of innovation, which is the key in keeping our workforce passionate engaged, both in the upskilling, but also in being future ready. To embrace that passion, we created the Agile Digital Studio for our people to continue to collaborate and innovate. Prior to the pandemic, we were doing this in person, but during the pandemic, what we were able to rely upon was to introduce technologies like VR, AR, and collaboration platforms to keep people connected and collaborating and innovating. The result was great because across the board, we increased invention disclosures during the pandemic as compared to before. That's, that's incredible. I just think that the work that all of your teams have done during the pandemic, um, I think as Kathy said, you know, really is heroic um, and really has taught us what is possible. Um, very exciting. Um, Osa, uh, we'd love to hear a bit about what you have done. I know that one of the things that stood out for us in the Louisville site was the way that you uh, went after kind of a multi-pronged approach to upskilling your workforce, including using a virtual reality platform, as well as collaborating with local universities. Can you tell us a bit about that? And also, you know, how important is it to bring the workforce along? Couldn't you just do this by, by deploying technology? Mm. No, thank you. And I promised myself I wouldn't make this all about 5G, but as you mentioned about the virtual, uh, and it's a virtual reality, but I think importantly augmented reality and XR uh, driven education. I think that's one of the most exciting use cases that I see uh, for 5G going forward. And it's not only for upskilling or reskilling, it's, you know, think about onboarding new people into your team or when you need expertise that you may not need to have on all sites, but you have on one site and can be with you literally in, in, in a mixed reality in the factory to help solve your problems. So I think there's a lot of exciting things that we use this actually to faster upskill our teams and also learn as we design new processes, new production flows with new methodologies and new technologies that frankly not even if we're a tech company, not all people in, in our factory will use to work with us. So that was a great way to kind of get them on board and it became even more important as we were uh, setting up this factory during uh, the pandemic so it was not always possible to be as many people physically on site as well so i think that that's really exciting and i think it comes back to you have to upskill and reskill both into new processes but then there also maybe new technologies new ways of working i think the other part that i think both katie and Catherine, uh, sorry katie and Kristen, both um, touch upon was really it's not only about reskilling and upskilling it's not as much about how you work together so one thing we learned to really make this happen and quickly implement new solutions you actually need to have people who, are, who typically work with production flows who very have the domain expertise in the processes together with some of the people from our side new the technology with the it folks we can actually scale this because otherwise you have a lot of folks everywhere but it doesn't really scale and work as well as working with our, uh, our sourcing supply chain, what we learned was typically these are engaged in different phases along the journey, and then it doesn't work, it doesn't scale, it gets stuck. So putting together that cross-functional team from the beginning when you start to launch new new ways of working, that was fundamental to us. So that, because I think it's part of the definition of how we think about agile ways of working, but I think it's also about bringing the multidisciplinary skills into your team, and that requires a new type of leadership and a new type of working. The, and, and of course, that also expands our partners because we're not delivering this in isolation. We work for the tech partners and all our regular suppliers. So it was everything from having our, some of our regular suppliers being okay with us accessing data for some of the applications and use cases for the uh, device scale. But it was also how did we work very strategically with some of our four to tech partners to make this happen. And then the final note that I really want to touch upon is, and I think it comes back to okay, Kevin's comment about the, the people, our people in the center of this transformation. We, we learned something. So the heroes of our transformation of Louisville, you may have thought if you want the discussion we had intensively two, three years ago, it was 
are simply the fact they're going to disappear, what job are they going to have? They actually realized they actually got even more empowered because they became the champions. We would not have been able to design our workflows and do them meaningful without them. So by, by making this happen, they actually became the heroes. Some of them had also got a new, very exciting role in the fact that more exciting than they had before. So I think in much more strategic. And what we learned within Ericsson is actually the, the team who set up the Lewis Field Factory, they become heroes because A, they became the blueprint on hey, this is how we do this. Global uh, example for Ericsson became the hero for product teams because when there have been supply chain challenges, they actually been able to use this to fix this much more effectively than we could ever done before. And third, mm -hmm. now I bring them as example to our customers. Now, when I, I want to sell a private network to show what they can enable in factories, it's actually the, the operations team. And that's not how, that's not the type of heroism that we actually had before we started place this. Um, so really exciting. And, and uh, again, it shows, I think, from how we really augmented the value of that skill. Uh, and then finally, I think by moving that way, if you apply it right, you can actually increase worker safety and it can shift also uh, a lot of the time you spend on the site actually much more valuable um, creative processes than perhaps there were sometimes before where some monotone or very heavy task where, which could sometimes be a, be, a, be a safety risk for, for many workers. So I think in my ways, I'm very optimistic and I'm even more excited to see some, not only to talk, but actually proof points from that today. I love that. Um, I, I, I just love the optimism that all three of you bring to really the future of, of manufacturing and operations and the future of, of work and being able to create wonderful experiences and, and really meaningful jobs for people. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to switch to one last question, which is a speed round. So I'm going to ask each of you for one or two word answers to what being part of the Global Lighthouse Network really means to you and your company. So let me start also with you. What, what word or two would you use? Inspiring and connectedness. That's fantastic. Christine, how about you? Alignment on common ground. Wow, not easy to come by. That's great. And Kathy? Stronger together. Love it. Well, thank you all for this really inspiring conversation. Each of your companies has been recognized as sustainability lighthouses and truly are showing us the way um, to achieve uh, real breakthroughs on sustainability in ways that um, I think we've never seen before. Uh, and as we've talked about, each of you and your companies are also showing us the magic of uh, investing in our workforce and unleashing the power that they bring uh, in innovation and performance. So thank you very much for being with us. Francisco and Eno, back to you. Thank you, Katie. It's now time to bring our event to a close. Many congratulations again to all our new lighthouses and especially to the three lighthouses who are designated as sustainability lighthouses. And of course, let me also say Q, Eno, and all our colleagues at the World Economic Forum at McKinsey for the amazing dedication and work which makes all this possible. Francesco, thanks to you as well, and to our audience for taking time out of their very busy schedules to join our Lighthouse Live event. We end our event with 103 lighthouses in our network and six designated sustainability lighthouses. What an amazing achievement. I hope you feel all inspired by the possibilities the lighthouses have shown us today. These 103 sites offer us a blueprint to scale digital adoption and answer some of the most pressing challenges of our time. I'm certainly inspired. However, we still have a lot of work to do. There are millions of facilities and companies around the world and that we want to reach and engage in the unique learning opportunity that the Global Lighthouse Network provides. Our network will continue to grow and we invite you all to reach out to us to learn more about the journey towards becoming a lighthouse. 
There are many benefits of being part of this unique global community of influential innovators. Benefits for you, your workforce, and the wider communities in which you operate. Thank you again to all for joining us today. Stay engaged and reach out to us at any time. Bye for now.